Hello. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me uh, to talk about this today. Uh, congratulations on your 10th anniversary, CQT. It's a, a fantastic achievement. So um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here and, uh, and be able to share this with you. Um, this uh, rather controversially titled book, uh, we, we worried about you know, who would want to buy a book about quantum astrology. And it, it's not a book about quantum astrology. I want to tell you that right now. Um, although, it, uh, when I looked last week, uh, or my wife received an email saying, this is the number one bestseller in astrology on Amazon at the moment. <laughs> So I like to think of this as doing unconventional outreach to the astrological community, because actually it's a book about quantum physics as well as being a book about uh, Jerome Cardano. Um, I have dubbed him the quantum astrologer, and you might wonder what that really means. So um, what is a quantum astrologer? Well, uh, that's not a quantum astrologer. But Arta, um, as many of you know, does have a great input on, on, on my kind of uh, shaping my thoughts on this book. In 2008, Arta actually produced a paper which he put on the archive as a kind of hobbyist, really, uh, look at uh, uh, Jerome Cardano. Uh, this is what Arta had to say. He said, I always found it an interesting coincidence that the two basic ingredients of modern quantum theory, namely probability and complex numbers, were discovered by the same person, an extraordinary man of many talents, a gambling scholar by the name of Girolamo uh, Cardano. Uh, so I recommend that you go and read um, Arta's paper. It's great, uh, great fun to, to go through. Um, I actually came to Cardano through another route. So my, my route to Cardano was when I was writing another of my books, and I was asking questions about what inspires scientists and where they come from. Um, and it turned out that scientists get their ideas from lots of interesting places. Uh, so you might get uh, Kekulé, who had dreams uh, that really gave him the structure of, of benzene. Um, and he was asleep on a London bus, in fact, when, when he had this dream. Uh, there's Einstein, who, of course, famously had the daydream when he was 16 years old about running alongside a light beam and trying to th figure out you know, whether the laws of physics would still apply as he was moving along with the light beam. And then uh, somebody like Michael Faraday, uh, used actually his faith and his understanding of the Bible to kind of inspire his thinking and think from a radically different perspective about uh, fields. Uh, that's Faraday demonstrating the first remote control there. So. Jerome Cardano, on the other hand, in his autobiography, which uh, is also a great read, um, he uh, said that a lot of his really good ideas came from the ministrations of an attending spirit. So this immediately caught my attention as somebody with a somewhat unconventional uh, set of, of uh, references that he would cite. So, so he would say that you know, he had a, visit that spirit, uh, that visit, a spirit that visited him most of his life. And, uh, and sometimes he got his uh, ideas for this. And actually his ideas were very significant. So uh, he was alive from 1501 to 1576. Uh, he lived mostly in Milan and Bologna. Uh, so this was uh, the, the period of the Renaissance. His father was a friend of Leonardo da Vinci's, in fact. And uh, Cardano spent uh, many afternoons on the floor in uh, da Vinci's house, you know, sitting, listening to the adults sort of talk about various things, including astrology. Uh, Cardano is the, the inventor of something that's called the Cardan joint, which is uh, still used in uh, manufacture of cars. Uh, it's about transmission of power uh, and uh, through different angles. So, so it's an invention that's ongoing. Uh, most people don't know about it. Uh, he was also an astrologer. Uh, he was uh, a mathematician. He trained as a doctor as well. So uh, one of the classic sort of Renaissance polymaths and um, a really interesting and colorful character. So I'm going to kind of give you an overview of some of what he did and, and how he th uh, thought. Uh, this won't be a difficult talk. Uh, no brain cells will be hurt, hurt at all during the receipt of this information, I pr assure you. Um, Interestingly, his contributions were big enough that uh, Gottfried Leibniz was a, a, a great fan of Cardano's work. And he said this, Cardano was a great man with all his faults. Without them, he would have been incomparable. And uh, we will look at the reasons why he was great. And uh, we'll also look at some of the faults as well, because they're quite amusing. So Cardano was a man of strange beliefs. Uh, because Jupiter was in the ascendant, he said, and Venus was the ruler of the horoscope, 
I was harmed only in my genitals. This uh, comes from his autobiography. Um, Cardano actually spent 10 years of his life impotent uh, between the ages of, of 20 and 30, uh, which caused him great consternation, as you can probably imagine. And he tried various uh, means of remedying this, uh, using te uh, treatments that he'd heard about and treatments that he kind of dreamed up for himself. Uh, I'm not going to go into any of the details. You'll be very glad to hear. But uh, again, sort of uh, greatly um, uh, documented in all his writings. Cardano wrote about four million words, uh, a huge amount of books, a huge amount of volumes, some of which he, uh, he lost because his cat would tear them up or, or urinate on them. Uh, others he burned himself towards the end of his life because he thought they weren't good enough. So we don't have everything that he wrote. Um, so Cardano uh, was very much uh, a believer, uh, certainly in some forms of astrology. He believed that actually there were some kind of influences uh, from the stars and planets. Uh, this was uh, something that he couldn't uh, ever escape from. He felt that the inaccuracies of astrology were probably due to uh, the weaknesses of our understanding of these things uh, rather than there not being anything quite in it. But he did question it. And it's very interesting to look through some of his writings and find that he would say uh, uh, various things, sort of questioning the, the tenets of astrology. He was um, strangely obsessed by elephants. There's no record of him ever actually having seen an elephant, but there's various things in his writings where he talks about elephants as being um, able to understand human speech. They recognize and enforce an oath, for instance, and worship the stars. So, so I, I don't want in any way for you to think that I think he was a modern thinker or, or you know, coming uh, you know, from the same kind of you know, intellectual rigor maybe that we are, although there are some interesting things that he, he had. He, he believed that an elephant would only board a ship uh, if it was given a promise that it would return to the place from whence it was taken. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, that's not true. But he did know how to reason. So this is uh, Cardano kind of looking at the issues of astrology. And uh, he's sort of saying, basically, uh, the predictions that come out are, are based on these things which are so far away. How can there be such a you know, distinct view for somewhere like uh, Cathay or China uh, and Italy, in Padua, in Italy, where he was when he made this statement? He said, how can, you know, how can something as distant as the stars and planets and the sun have an influence that, that is different for a few uh, basically a few sort of thousand miles across on Earth, and sort of trying to make this distinction. And he, he said, you know, I'm a cynic, but I, I, I kind of feel like I shouldn't be, but I can't help sort of questioning these things. So, you know, he said, how could the, the smaller ones, the, the distant stars, seem to malign from such a height? So he did question the tenets of, of these kinds of things, uh, actually much to his father's uh, annoyance. Um, and when he heard reports of alchemical sort of miracles and wonders, he actually managed to uh, you know, have a good degree of skepticism about these. So uh, when he heard a report of somebody who had done uh, t turning mercury into gold uh, in front of all the authorities of the city, uh, it was a neighboring city, uh, his response was this. Whichever way this may have come about, it's quite certain that mercury cannot be changed into gold. And so he was quite sort of skeptical about some of the claims that were being made around him. And he was able to think, at least, uh, in certain, uh, certain sort of contexts. He was able to reason and make, uh, you know, I think, uh, reasonable and sensible statements about what was going on around him. He was very much into um, observing and sort of thinking uh, about things in the way that we like to think that we would. Uh, he actually conducted experiments, uh, not many experiments, uh, but um, he, this was his response to a, an experiment that he, he had seen demonstrated where somebody would magnetize a needle on a lodestone and insert it into their skin uh, and say the, the magnetization of the needle causes it to basically uh, numb any pain. So you won't feel any pain. Uh, you can put this needle into your arm. Uh, because it's magnetized on a lodestone, you won't get the, uh, the effect. And uh, so Cardano, having a kind of, you know, the mind that he had, he decided that he would have to try this for himself. And this is what he said. He said, I could feel the needle penetrating into the depths on its journey, but I felt no pain whatever. And then I believed my friends because I tried it out on myself. So that may be one of the first uh, recorded incidences of the placebo effect. Is there anything I can think? Because uh, I haven't actually personally tried it, but I'm pretty sure that a magnetized needle stuck into my arm is going to hurt. So don't try this at home, please. It's, it, you know, whatever he says, it's probably not true. But I like the fact that he was trying it. 
And uh, I also, um, there were records of him uh, actually doing experiments to try and determine the relative density of air and water. And he got a, 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 a 50 to 1, uh, sorry, 1 to 50 ratio uh, from his experiment, which involved basically firing a, a bullet into a column of water and then firing a bullet through air and measuring the time uh, it, it took to stop. So, uh, so he's... Uh, yeah, at least willing to kind of endorse some kind of experimental method and, and sort of also investigate the world around him. His major contribution, or his first major contribution, was uh, to lay out the rules of probability. So this was uh, a century before, he, uh, before Pascal and Fermat and uh, others were able to kind of lay down uh, what we can't, you know, in many textbooks actually is, is seen as the start of the laws of probability. He did this because he had a gambling problem. So um, necessity drove him while he was a student. And he was paying his, his university tuition, effectively, and, and making uh, ends meet by gambling in taverns and, and, uh, and taking on anyone who would come. And he realized that actually in dice games and in card games, uh, he could uh, get an advantage and understand how to bet if he understood what the probability of various outcomes were. So he uh, made a lot of notes about how things would turn out if you roll one dice or, or roll several dice. And, uh, and so he, he came to the point where he was able to say, so there's a general rule, namely that we should consider the whole circuit, which means the whole array of, of, of outcomes, and uh, the number of those casts of the dice, which represent in how many ways the favorable result can occur, and compare that number to the rest of the circuit. And according to that proportion, should the mutual wages be laid that one may contend on equal terms. So with a fair die, effectively, he's saying, you know, there are ways to work out the right way to bet on this, which, of course, we all know now. Um, at the time, he was literally the only person who knew this, and he still managed to lose a lot of money in his gambling. So uh, theoretical knowledge can be of, of some use, but uh, it's not always of, of great practical use unless you know how to apply it properly. Uh, but this is um, literally the, the start of probability. Unfortunately, his notes were not published until um, after uh, his death, so uh, actually after the point where others had, had come across these and worked out these, these rules. He came up with a law of large numbers as well and realized that you know, a huge number of, of, uh, of probabilistic events uh, would uh, lead to a kind of general result. So um, he was really thinking quite hard about these things. Um, and extraordinarily, uh, Cardano was even able to kind of think in abstract things. So he was a great lover of mathematics, which we'll kind of get onto. Um, but he, he says uh, during his uh, derivations of solutions for cubic equations, uh, he comes across this idea of the root, uh, square root of a negative number. Other people had come across these before and always assumed they'd made some kind of mistake in their calculations. So when they saw that they were having to, you know, halfway through uh, a, a derivation, they were actually, or a proof, they were actually having to deal with square roots of negative numbers, they would, you know, look for some reason why this had appeared. Um, people knew at the time that the square root of a negative number was, uh, was problematic. And, and he says, uh, note that root of 9 is neither plus 3 or minus 3. For a plus times a plus or a minus times a minus yields a plus. Therefore, the root of minus 9 is neither plus 3 or minus 3, but is some recondite third sort of thing. So this is the first kind of real recognition that of, of the imaginary number, the idea that there is something else apart from positive and negative real numbers. And uh, Cardano never did much with it. Uh, he kind of acknowledged its existence. He never uh, sort of went on to use it or develop it. In fact, he, he kind of thought it might be entirely useless. Uh, sophistic was uh, one, one translation of, of how he, um, he saw it. But I like this idea that it's a recondite third sort of thing, because as everyone in this room knows, uh, these imaginary numbers uh, are central, really, to everything that we're trying to uh, achieve in, in quantum theory, as, as Arta laid out in his paper. Uh, you know, these are, this is one of the pillars of, of, uh, of quantum theory, is actually complex numbers that involve this imaginary number uh, that Cardano was the first to uh, appreciate. He also, uh, as I said, he trained as a doctor. He, he was uh, unable to practice from uh, a good part of his early life 
uh, even though he, was, he did extremely well at medical school. Uh, basically, the, the problem was that, uh, for a start, he was quite a cantankerous character and didn't really get on terribly well with uh, other people, especially those in authority over him. Uh, the second problem he had was that actually he was born out of wedlock. And um, being born out of wedlock, in the, in the, certainly to the Milanese uh, College of Physicians, was tantamount to being um, a second-class citizen. And there was no way they were going to have anyone in their College of Physicians who was, uh, a, a, for want of a better word, a bastard. And it, so they denied him a, a license to practice medicine for a very long time. And uh, he struggled around sort of trying to make a living. The gambling wasn't really working for him. And so he would, he would kind of practice as an underground doctor. So, so he would uh, roam around at night and, and sort of go with a, he, he talks about going around with a dark cloak on and a hood up through the streets to visit somebody who had called him, basically illegally practicing medicine uh, as a kind of guerrilla doctor. So, um, but his uh, thinking and his ability to think actually worked very well for him in his uh, endeavors to, to kind of uh, bring cures to people. So uh, as Nancy Ceresi says uh, in her uh, biography of his medical work, uh, she says, Cardano repeatedly urged in a manner highly unusual in the 16th century that the first thing to ask about a supposed marvel was not what had caused it, but whether it had in fact happened. And this is kind of uh, unusual thinking for his time, was that he did not believe the kind of res reports of, of other cures that had gone on. Uh, he actually sort of questioned everything that people said to him. So as a kind of proto-scientist and, and a great cynic, uh, it stood him in very good stead. And he ended up actually being called uh, to work for a Franciscan friar who had been ill for uh, a number of years, and all of Milan's doctors had failed to, to make this friar better. And he, he was suffering with uh, some, some kind of skin condition and also a general malaise. And uh, he was, uh, Cardano was called in desperation, in fact, as the last resort because nobody else was able to do anything. And this uh, Friar, uh, Friar uh, Gadoli um, received Cardano and Cardano sort of did a diagnosis, which was basically to say, well, actually, let's look at your lifestyle. And... Uh, and Cardano's prescription after looking at the, the Franciscan friar's lifestyle was, well, you basically need to stop flagellating yourself, uh, stop fasting all the time, uh, relax a bit, and, uh, and basically eat a healthy diet. And he sent him away into the hills uh, and said, you know, go for six months and just sort of be outside of the, the, the priory, uh, go and sort of live a decent life for six months and then come back. And um, lo and behold, uh, this was exactly the cure that the, the, the friar needed. And it's, uh, it's recorded as the, basically the world's first spa cure. Um, so, so Cardano sort of sent him basically to relax and to have, you know, be in a nice place with fresh air, uh, to eat well, and not uh, stress himself out over whether he'd missed morning prayers. And, uh, and it turned out that this was a, a fantastic cure and really changed the friar's life. And uh, because the friar was a man of some influence in the town, uh, Cardano then was called upon by everybody, all the nobility around, to start uh, consulting on them. And he became uh, a credible doctor and, uh, and was eventually admitted into the College of Physicians despite his birth. And eventually actually came to be the, the director of the College of Physicians. Uh, so uh, he was you know, rehabilitated, but it, uh, it was really through his ability to stand back and look at the situation and, and not go with the, the normal kind of uh, prescriptions. Uh, so Cardano was uh, obsessed by numbers. Um, and interestingly, it really started with his, his uh, ideas about astrology, and he wanted to understand uh, not just astrology, but astronomy too. This is a time before the invention of the telescope. And astrologers, of course, had enormous uh, banks of star charts that they, they would consult. And uh, the charts would uh, sort of lay out how the stars and the planets were going to move throughout the heavens. And Cardano and many other astrologers knew that actually that meant that they would need an, an understanding of astronomy. And so Cardano actually, as well as publishing some astrological kind of uh, predictions and, and uh and, and, and other documents. I uh, also published a book on astronomy. Uh, one biographer in, uh, actually called him the kind of the Carl Sagan of his age because he, he taught the public, the general public, how to look at the heavens, how to look up, what to see, what to look for, how are things going to move. 
And as well as you know, wanting to educate the general public about this, and also it set him apart from the other astrologers, actually, to be able to sort of publicly say, oh, well, you know, mine is based on science. Uh, you know, I, I can tell you how the stars move because you know, this is how astronomy works. Uh, so it was a kind of selling point for his, his book that, that actually it would enable you to sort of make sense of who was good at astrology and who wasn't by the, those who actually knew how the, how the heavens worked. But of course, um, in order to understand how the heavens work and make predictions about how things are going to go, you need to understand geometry and other forms of mathematics. And so he set about studying these things and, uh, and became really um, obsessed by numbers and, and really sort of fell in love with, with the various forms of mathematics that he came across and felt that they were really a very profound way to understand the universe. So he says it, it's not only what is hidden in forms, as in the physical world, but what is hidden in numbers that has a cause as well. So if you wanted to kind of understand the, the things behind reality, the things behind the universe, you'd have to understand you know, how numbers worked. So you had this kind of sense that, uh, that you know, maybe there was something to be gained by actually studying the various forms of mathematics. And this led him to uh, an interesting situation which has become uh, quite a bone of contention over whether uh, Cardano actually stole somebody else's result. And this will be sort of one of the first, uh, you know, or one of the, the points at which I make the point about how uh, men of learning and academia are actually quite brutal and cunning, as I've seen this week at CQT. Um, so the Ars Magna is uh, Cardano's huge book of algebra, basically. He was a great fan of the Islamic scholars. And when he received uh, Latin translations of, of Islamic uh, algebra uh, books and, and documents and, and uh, other, other kind of uh, communications, he studied them intensely and decided that what he would do, his great contribution really, would be to, to create a kind of complete compendium of algebra and how algebra worked. And uh, he wanted to be able to put out this book as complete as possible in, in his lifetime and uh, was really loath to put out a half-finished book, even though he knew there were certain results uh, that, that nobody had as yet. So um, the, the controversy over this started uh, with the solutions to this equation. So the basic, uh, basic you know, form of the cubic equation. And uh, in 1494, um, a, a scholar called Luigi Paglioli had published a book um, basically saying that you could never solve, a, there would never be a general solution for a cubic equation. Uh, it can't be done. And, uh, and to add extra authority to this book and to the, its, its pronouncement, uh, he had it illustrated by none other than Leonardo da Vinci. So if you, know, if you think your papers are good, I bet you know, none of you have had anything illustrated by Leonardo da Vinci. I think it kind of takes it to a whole other level in terms of selling it. Um, so da Vinci did the illustrations for this book, but the, the, the claim was that there was no such thing as a general uh, solution, and, and it, it laid out a proof why you would never find a general solution to a cubic equation. Uh, that was uh, largely ignored by a man called uh, Scipio Ferius, or Scipio della Ferro. And, um, and what he did was at least find a partial solution. So Scipio uh, found this partial solution in, I, th I think it was, uh, it, I'm trying to think, 1505 perhaps, uh, and kept it to himself. And there's a very good reason why scholars of this time did not publish their, their solutions, because having a solution that nobody else had was actually a means to riches and, uh, and uh, further jobs. And so uh, Scipio really kept it to himself um, and, and there's no strong record of what he did with it, but the general uh, the culture at the time was that if you wanted a job at a university, for instance, a teaching job, you had to show that you were better than you know, the person who had the job right now at mathematics. So if you wanted to be a maths lecturer, you basically would challenge this other guy to a public competition, and uh, you would lay out, each other, lay out uh, 30 problems for each other to solve. And if you had a solution that nobody else had, then you could base all of your problems around that solution and be fairly confident that nobody else would be able to solve uh, the, uh, the, the, the problems based around that equation. And thus, you'd make them look foolish. Uh, the, the, the surrounding crowd, the, the administrators of the university, wouldn't really necessarily understand the mathematics, but they'd understand who had a result and who didn't. And so this was the way in which jobs were won quite often. Uh, they also used, uh, these kinds of solutions were used 
uh, by the bankers and financiers uh, who would issue loans based on uh, equations that, that their pet mathematicians could solve. So, so physicists and mathematicians going into finance is not a new thing by any means at all. Um, anyone who can solve equations that, that offer a prediction for how things are going to unfold was actually extremely useful in terms of calculating interest uh, due on a loan uh, and, and making predictions of who was going to make money, who was worth lending money to, and at what rate. So mathematicians have always been useful uh, to, to financiers, and they've always been competitive in terms of wanting to be a better mathematician than others. And uh, so Ferrius kept this solution to himself. Uh, but eventually he became ill, and in 1526 he was on his deathbed. And on his deathbed, he decided that actually it was time to pass this solution on. So he passed it on to two people. Those two people were Antonio Maria Fior, who was his student. So he actually kept, his, kept this solution from his student. I don't know what his student had been doing all this time, but uh, clearly not working out what this solution was. And Antonio Maria Fior was actually known to be quite lazy and quite stupid. Uh, so maybe that's the answer, and I'm sure none of you have students like that. Um, uh, the other person was Annibale della Nave, who was uh, uh, Scipio's son-in-law. So he kind of kept it in the family, effectively. Obviously, he wouldn't pass it on to his daughter because I presume she was a woman, and uh, you know, th at that time I think it was kind of seen as quite dubious to, to be doing mathematics if you were female. So, um, so these two people now have this solution, uh, and. As I've said, one of them was a bit stupid, one of them was a bit lazy. Uh, uh, Annibale de Nave basically didn't do anything with it, just kind of kept it. I don't know what he did for a living, but he had possession of this solution and never really uh, exploited it in any way. Uh, Fior, on the other hand, uh, besides being a bit lazy and stupid, was actually quite uh, a difficult man. Uh, so uh, Ferius, uh, Scipio Ferius dies. Uh, the secret is with just the two, two of them. Fior decides that he's going to put this thing to work. So he's had uh, a, a long uh, career as, as a Scipio student, and now he has finally something that he can use to get himself a decent job. And uh, he means to do it because his personality is such that he's quite willing to take anyone on if necessary. The person that he decides to target is a Venetian lecturer uh, called Niccolo Tartaglia. Tartaglia has a job in Venice teaching mathematics, and uh, Tartaglia is entirely self-taught, an extraordinary character um, who suffered enormous uh, privations as a child. Um, his father was killed by uh, French soldiers in Gascony, um, and uh, there was no money in the household. His father was a postman, in fact. Uh, but there was no, so when there was no money in the household, he couldn't go to school. And so he, he managed to scrape together enough money for six days of education, during which he, to, he stole his teacher's notebook. And uh, so having you know, run out of money, not being able to pay for any more education, he actually had his teacher's textbook with him and just taught himself uh, how to do the various sort of uh, things that he needed to do. So he got halfway through the alphabet uh, in school. The rest of it was all self-taught. And, uh, and he taught himself mathematics, he taught himself a lot of um, uh, literature, uh, some geometry. Uh, Tartaglia actually did a very good job of, of educating himself. Unfortunately, he was a, a pretty irascible, difficult character and, and was actually thrown out of his hometown twice uh, because he annoyed people so much. But, so Tartaglia um, has this job in Venice uh, that he's managed to get himself uh, despite incredibly adverse circumstances. And he uh, takes it on. And, uh, and he's earning himself a living, which is against all odds, really, in the situation that he was in. And then along comes Fior, who basically challenges him to a mathematics competition. Now, Tartaglia has heard rumors that Fior has this solution. And so Tartaglia actually, to his credit, goes back to the cubic equation and says, right, I need, really need to give this some thought before we have this competition. And uh, so uh, he goes to it, and he actually comes up with solutions for the cubic equation. And he comes up with more solutions than Fior has. So when it comes to the debate, the, the public sort of mass competition, uh, he actually trounces Fior completely, uh, destroying him and destroying any hope that he had of, of getting a job. So Tartaglia uh, is, is sort of reigns supreme and, the, and the, the, the talk of the town, effectively. Uh, so being the talk of the town, uh, he's at, he comes to the attention of Jerome Cardano in Milan. Cardano is looking to publish his Ars Magna, and he hears now that there are solutions floating around that he wants to include in his book. So he quite uh, uh, understandably goes to Tartaglia 
and says, would you please um, share your solutions with me so I can publish them in the book for the good of all humankind and we can have this amazing uh, mathematics book that's full of all the solutions. Uh, Tartaglia says, no, I won't tell you anything. Uh, why, would I, why would I share this with you? Uh, again, quite understandably, since his career depends on, on mathematical superiority. So Cardano keeps going and going and going and eventually wears him down to the point where uh, Tartaglia is just bored of this whole conversation. And he passes uh, his solution to the cubic equation to Cardano, actually in the form of a poem. And this wasn't actually the first time in maths history that, that uh, solutions to equations were passed in a poem. But uh, basically, he gave Cardano the challenge of decoding the poem and, uh, and finding the solution, which actually he did. So Cardano was working with his student, uh, Lodovico Ferrari, and together they, they uh, not only decoded this solution, but actually were able to go back to the equation and come up with some more, uh, a general solution to the, to the cubic equation which depended on Tartaglia's result. But Tartaglia, unfortunately, had told Cardano that he was not to publish this at all. So although he shared it with him, he said, you cannot publish it. And so for many years, Cardano had this uh, solution. Uh, he also had other solutions that he derived from this solution. Uh, he had uh, an enormous amount of stuff that he wanted to share with the world and wasn't able to share it because of a promise not to share it because Tartaglia said, you may not publish it. So he hadn't permission to publish. Uh, Cardano was not stupid, though. So Cardano realized, or through gossip, that actually this man down here has the solution as well and has done nothing with it. So he goes and makes a, a trip with his student to Annabale de la Nave and basically persuades him to divulge the, the secret solution that Scipio Ferrius came up with. And having uh, that meant that he didn't need, actually, to publish Tartaglia's solution. He now had his own version of the solution, which had come from another source. So he was able to publish Ars Magna, although there is, is very clear things in his writing that show that he's, he realizes this is not ideal. Um, and Tartaglia is, of course, extremely annoyed. And this is the, the result. And so Tartaglia actually goes and looks at the book and, and, says, and points out all of the printing errors in the book to Tartaglia in, in a series of long letters about how rubbish his book is. And you can't believe that uh, Cardano is such a terrible mathematician. Uh, and he says there's actually mistakes in some of the proofs as well, and points those out uh, in a kind of, you know, a very brutal form of peer review. But the point is that Cardano has now published his Ars Magna, his great work of mathematics, and uh, is very pleased. And I like to think as well that, that uh, Scipio Ferrius is quite pleased about the whole thing from beyond the grave. It's a, a, an astonishing story, and still the, the subject of some controversy over whether Cardano was right or wrong uh, to, to make this uh, step. So Cardano used his numbers, he used his, sort of, uh, his knowledge of, of algebra uh, to uh, try and understand how the natural world worked. But of course, it was a, a phase where it was very difficult to perform mathematics, really. Um, the notation uh, that we use wasn't there, so it was very cumbersome. But he did a lot of thinking about various things in cosmology. And I just really want to kind of lay out some of the, the stuff that... Um, that he was thinking about, because it, it, as a science journalist, it really reminds me of some of the things that, uh, that we end up sort of thinking about sort of generally, not so much in, this, uh, in the quantum physics community, but in the cosmology community generally. There are lots of issues to be solved and lots of things that don't make sense. So uh, Cardano here is talking about you know, how things move through the universe. He says, since heaven is never at rest and has soul present everywhere, it can never be wearied. But the problem is not so clear about the moon's orbit, which carries the ether along with it. It ought to get wearied. So here, of course, all of the premises here are wrong as in our, from our perspective now. But he is actually looking into these kind of issues and saying, well, you know, if we have this and this, and if people are saying that this moves like this, what about solving the problem of, of this? And I think the thinking here is, is something that we would say. And I, I think there are the, I mean, the ether was stayed with us until the turn of the 20th century. So um, you know, for, for 300 years, this wasn't terrible thinking you know, when you're trying to understand what the ether does and, and whether it impedes movement through the heavens. But also, you know, there are shades for me here of, of cosmology's issues with understanding dark energy and dark matter. And, and you know, there are many puzzles now, which maybe in 400 years' time, people will be looking back at what we're writing and saying, well, that was ridiculous, wasn't it? Um, he also grappled with time and the issues of what time was. So uh, he, he split it up into two different kinds of time, uh, the kind of eternal uh, cosmic time and the passing time. Uh, he says eternity is what it is in itself stable, 
What runs forth and remains is time, the avum. What does not remain and flows is passing time. So since the universe is seen to remain, it's in time, and passing time is in the universe. Now, I've done a lot of reading of modern sort of thinking about what time is, and I, I think this is as confusing as any of those. So I think, I think you know, obfuscation is probably the answer here. And uh, he obfuscates massively in his creation of a cosmology. So uh, this, this is uh, Cardano's description of the whole universe. The center corresponds to every point of the circumference and remains stationary as the sphere rotates. In this way, eternity remains fixed within the infinity of time. It does not expand, it does not grow, it's always at rest. The universe, apparently at rest, is contained within eternity and with the universe, time flows. I mean, it's an attempt. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll give him that. So, so this is a man who, in the 1550s, was grappling with issues of, you know, trying to understand the structure of the universe from a geometric perspective, trying to understand, you know, what time is and, and how time sort of fits into our descriptions of the universe. And I just like the fact that he's trying. You know, I'm not saying that I understand anything that he's saying, uh, but the fact that he's trying and kind of, you know, thinking in these ways sort of reminds me, uh, and I hopefully reminds us, that, that human beings have always been thinking about these kinds of things and always uh, been grappling with, uh, uh, with scientific ideas, with mathematical ideas, with geometric ideas, and uh, we're still not there yet. So I think you know, some intellectual humility, uh, although you, know, you can sneer at this and you can sort of say it doesn't make sense and it's, it's not really helpful, uh, I think I could say a lot of that about modern science as well. Um, I'd like to uh, just point out that he actually did some thinking about how uh, life on Earth arose and, and the various forms it took. And uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, from, again, from the same book on subtlety, uh, 1550. He says, herbivorous beasts, being foolish and timid, they need to be fleet of foot to survive. Those that cannot be speedy do not establish a species. So for me, this is a really interesting precursor to the idea of the survival of the fittest. This is effectively what he's saying is they don't, um, he's comparing them to the, all the animals with teeth, the predators, and just saying, you know, if you, if you not fast enough, you won't survive as a species. And I think that's a quite a nice sort of precursor to, to what came, you know, so many hundred years later uh, with Darwin. So, so again, you know, the, he's a thinker who actually, you know, has some notions of, of, uh, of how the world works that, that seem familiar. Um, also here, uh, he's talking about uh, what happens with physical deformities. And he's incredibly um, credulous about some things. So he, he, he believes there is such a thing as a wolverine that lives in Lithuania that has all the you know, hallmarks of a wolverine that we all know so well. Um, but he also says that you know, there are some things that are just sort of the product of natural error. So uh, the blind, the deaf, the squint-eyed, the limping, those with six fingers, astrologers very readily settle the problem, saying that witches are in charge. But Cardano's answer is, we will put, the, put it that nature has erred. So he has this idea that actually, you know, maybe some things just go wrong rather than there always having to be a cause uh, you know, in the kind of human sphere. This is at a time, I mean, he lived at a time when uh, the Catholic Church had just pu published uh, the book on witchcraft, Ma uh, I can't think of its name now, uh, Maleficum, anyway. Um, and so, you know, this is a time when people are kind of obsessed with the powers of witches and, and uh, wizards, and, and uh, obviously all occult practices are, are, are very much ruled out, but very much happening in the background of everyone's lives. And, uh, and Cardano, at the same time as believing some very odd things, actually is able to say, well, maybe some things don't have a kind of occult cause. Maybe it's just the way nature works. Um, and here's a very modern thought that I like very much. Um, Cardano uh, talking about uh, nationalism. There's no reason to brag about your fatherland. What is a fatherland but a conspiracy of petty tyrants to oppress the weak, the timid, and those who are basically innocent? And uh, that's something I could apply right now in the 20th, 21st century, I would say, in many parts of this world. So here's a man who uh, was incredibly, I think, clever, uh, incredibly erudite, uh, well-educated, although he, you know, he received a good education uh, through, his, uh, through scholars hired by his family. He also spent a lot of time studying and working hard to understand the world around him. In fact, he said, you know, I'm, I'm much more wealthy in knowledge than I am in money. He, he acknowledged very early on that it, this was no route to riches. Um, and he was a celebrated man. Uh, interesting point on religious tolerance, actually. Uh, the, the Mohammedans themselves have strong points. They refrain from slaughter, dice, adultery, and unprincipled deeds against God. 
and unspeakable blasphemies, four faults by which the whole Christian population is almost crushed. Um, he's writing this at a time when the, the um, Inquisition is just starting to kick off. Uh, so it's not perhaps the wisest thing he's ever done, uh, but he publishes it anyway. And in other uh, parts of his writings, he publishes uh, conversations between uh, a, a, a Jew, Jewish people, uh, Islamic people, and Christian people about the various sort of beliefs that they have, and point, uh, makes, tries to make the point that actually all of these people are kind of trying to do the right thing, and therefore um, are all to be commended and lauded. And uh, again, this is not something that you really want to be publishing at this point in history as we'll soon see. But he was a celebrated man during his lifetime. So um, he makes this statement about the honors that were given him after he returned from a trip to, uh, to the UK, actually, via uh, France. He was called by the Archbishop of Scotland uh, to come and visit him. The Archbishop had heard about his curative powers. He'd heard about his, his ability to kind of make a good diagnosis. And the Archbishop was, su was suffering from extremely debilitating asthma, which was a, actually a threat to the Scottish throne at the time. He, his brother was on the throne, was the King of Scotland. Uh, Hamilton was the, the guy who was advising him all the time, but often spent weeks bedridden and I, unable to do anything because of his asthma attacks. And, uh, and so he'd heard about the, the, this amazing doctor that there was in Milan and sent for him to come. And uh, so Cardano traveled up through, uh, through France. Uh, when he entered the city of Lyon, he was held at the gates and told that he wasn't to proceed any further until the mayor of Lyon had put on a proper procession for him to go through the city. That's kind of how, how famous and how celebrated he was. When he got to Paris uh, on his way up to, uh, to go to England, uh, he was told again he had to delay his journey until they'd put on a medical conference for him. So he wasn't able to kind of wire ahead and say that he was go he was coming, when he arrived and they realized they had the great Cardano among them, basically he wasn't allowed to leave until they'd had a medical conference uh, to talk about all the latest kind of ideas. So I don't know if any, any of you have ever had that kind of treatment when you've arrived in a city, but uh, I think it would be quite enjoyable. So eventually he got to uh, England and went up through England uh, to Scotland. He described the English as like Italians, but far hairier, um, which is probably fair. Uh, and uh, he got to Scotland, and they were even hairier still there. He said, you know, in England, I saw somebody with like, hair all down their front. And he said, but when I got to Scotland, I found somebody who had hair down their back too. <laughs> so, uh, so he got to Scotland, and he actually uh, looked at the lifestyle of, uh, of the archbishop, and, and again, basically prescribed a cure that involved changing his pillow, changing the hours he kept, changing what he ate and drank. Uh, changing uh, the environs in which he lived, uh, moving out of a drafty room. And again, sort of very sensible kind of, uh, um, and probably you know, in some ways the kinds of things that you get today in that we don't have a, a way to cure asthma and we, we now have you know, chemical uh, ways of, of uh, stimulating airflows. But actually you know, what Cardano did was uh, the best thing that could be done at the time in terms of uh, curing this asthma. And the Archbishop was incredibly grateful and uh, so grateful that he sent him away with a huge amount of money. And, um, and, but while he was in, in, the, uh, in the Scottish Archbishop's Palace, he received a letter from the King of England, uh, from Edward VI, who was uh, King Henry VIII's son, asking him to come to the royal court in England on his way back to, to um, do a diagnosis on the king as well. Edward VI was, was famously very sickly, uh, died very young. Uh, and so Cardano went to the court of Edward VI and talked to the boy king um, and sort of didn't, very cannily actually, didn't get involved in doing much medical diagnosis with him because what he found around him in, in the royal court was a whole load of intrigue and a whole load of uh, things going on that he didn't really want to be part of. So everyone knew the king was quite sick um, the, the king apparently was an incredibly intelligent young man, and they talked about things like you know, refraction from crystals and, and uh, you know, quite uh, sort of sophisticated conversations. Um, but really, what, the reason why he had been called was so that uh, Cardano could make uh, a couple of, of, uh, of, of comments, really, that would be public comments that the, the sort of those who were scheming around the throne could use. One of the things was he was asked... Uh, Cardano was asked to, to endorse the king's new title as defender of the faith, which was the thing that Henry VIII, had, you know, when he'd split from the, the Catholic Church, had decided that he was going to be called defender of the faith. And uh, they asked Cardano to endorse this. Cardano, you know, knowing that he was about to return to a Catholic country, decided that he wouldn't do this and backed off and thus lost the thousand crowns that he'd been promised uh, to, in order to do this. So although he, he did quite like money, he didn't like money that much. And he kind of realized that if he made the wrong statement, he may never get home alive. 
Um, he was also asked to draw up a horoscope for King Edward VI. And, uh, and of course, he agreed to do this uh, as it was kind of part of his offering. He'd also done a horoscope for the Archbishop Hamilton in Scotland. Uh, but he kind of fudged it. Uh, interestingly, um, you know, I hope we all kind of believe that there is no power of prediction within uh, astrology, but he didn't want to take the risk. So he said he really didn't look very hard at the stars and didn't spend a long time doing the chart and basically came out with a, a prediction that said, yes, the king will live to sort of the age of 46 and uh, he'll be you know, in quite good health. Well, he have a few scares along the way, but everything's going to be fine. And then he scarpered. And uh, I think uh, it was sort of 18 months later, the king was dead. Uh, but what had happened, what Cardano realized was that if he got involved in this and made any kind of prediction about the king's imminent death, he was likely to never, ever get out of the country alive. So uh, he made the kind of, you know, the, the move to kind of cut his losses and run. So he was a celebrated man. So the question uh, you have to ask is what happened? Because it turns out that he's kind of been forgotten in, in many circles now. Immediately after his life, he was still, um, still known and, and some of his works were still very much appreciated. And Tycho Bray was a big fan. Uh, as I've shown you, Leibniz was a fan. Uh, but actually things sort of did, did sort of disappear. And certainly in the UK, he's, he's really very well unknown. Uh, Interestingly, there's an Italian uh, translation of my book, and initially the Italian publisher said, well, this is an Italian hero. Why are we going to have a book written by uh, some British guy about, about you know, one of our great heroes? And he'd gone back and, and kind of researched the market and, uh, and talked to people and, and realized that Cardano had largely, largely been lost from Italian literature as well in terms of common understanding. So he's no Galileo, he's no Newton. Uh, what happened to him? Well, uh, really, that's the story of three popes. As I said, he was known for publishing some questionable things. One of the things that he published and handed to this pope, uh, so this is Paul III, I think, um, and he uh, gave him a horoscope of Jesus, which, you know, you would argue is a bad idea, but actually... Uh, Paul III was a great fan of, of, uh, of astrology and thought this was useful and uh, was, was a great, uh, were very grateful for the gift. Unfortunately, popes come and popes go, and, uh, and the next pope uh, that he encountered was this kind of evil Santa, um, who is uh, Pius V. Pius V uh, was leading the Inquisition. Uh, very much against uh, astrology because it seemed to be manipulating God. You know, it, it, the idea, if you can make a pr prediction about the nature of God, then you're, you're in a position where you will uh, try, you're trying to force God's hand, effectively. And, and so in, uh, in 1570, uh, Cardano was arrested. He was never allowed to tell anyone uh, why the Inquisition arrested him. Uh, a condition of his release five months later was that he never ever speak of, of the Inquisition or what had happened to him or what he'd been accused of. Uh, what we do know is that after his release, he was, uh, he was banned from public, uh, publishing, from teaching and everything else. So he was in a position where he wasn't allowed to really earn his living uh, as he normally had. And uh, he was uh, subject to a great amount of, uh, of uh, uh, scandal, really, because of his position. Uh, he was eventually rehabilitated slightly under this sort of nice Santa uh, Pope, who is Gregory the Thirteenth, uh, who allowed him to have a pension and uh, and sort of uh, Cardano moved to Rome and uh, was able to sort of live under this Pope's protection. But his academic career never really recovered. I wanted to. I haven't got time to go through this. I, I just wanted to make the point that that. Um, Cardano is not the only one who was thinking. So in the 12th and 13th centuries, um, you have things like uh, Bishop Robert Grossetest uh, looking into optics and, understand, and trying to come up with uh, understanding of where color comes from and, uh, in light. Um, and uh, then, of course, there's the Islamic experiments by uh, Ibn al-Haytham, uh, who showed that light travels in straight lines using a pinhole camera. As, and that's sort of uh, 965 to 1040 he lived. So, so you know, the, the idea that science started with Newton is a very big problem for me. Um, neither is peer review. So this is a, a great quote. This is um, from Leibniz in a, in a volume called Against Barbaric Physics. And he says, men will from time to time revert to darkness out of boredom with light. Ours is such a time with great opportunities to learn the right things being spurned and a wealth of the most lucid truths being disregarded in favor of obscure trivialities. And does anybody know who he's talking about? He's talking about the work of Isaac Newton and the idea of forces. 
and uh, forces, you know, so you can come up with a radical idea that centuries later is celebrated. Uh, at the time, Leibniz used it as, a, as an example of the new barbaric physics that was going on. So uh, Leibniz is not a great fan of Newton, as everyone knows, but I think even that is pretty harsh review. Uh, and academia has always been tough, so um, uh, just a, a few examples to close. So, so Cardano, uh, during the, the latter part of his career teaching in Bologna, uh, his peers hated him uh, for various reasons. And so uh, they convinced the university administrators uh, to give him the after lunch slot uh, in his lectures, um, which actually is what I've been given today. So. Um, And uh, they also, uh, when that failed to kind of deter him, they, they, they made the administrators double book the room so that he always had to fight somebody else off in order to c conduct his lectures. And uh, this caused him great consternation. And he details all this in his autobiography. Um, he, uh, then they, when that failed, they basically just reported that uh, Cardano was e lecturing to empty halls. None of his students were ever turning up. And uh, it really wasn't worth employing him. Uh, this was a scheme basically because the, the dean of the, the university had a friend who wanted Cardano's job. And, uh, and this was the scheme by which they, they tried to do it. And when all else failed, uh, they actually invented some really horrible, scurrilous rumors about his lifestyle and about what he was doing. Uh, he was renting out rooms in his house, really to make money um, to various people. And there were rumors about his, uh, his uh, sexual impropriety uh, that were completely fabricated, but did a very good job of undermining him. So uh, at various points in his life, he, he sort of struggled with all these kind of academic uh, issues. Uh, he never really understood why people took against him so much. But partly he said, it's just because I, you know, I'm, I'm better than they are. He wasn't a humble man. And just a, a final word here. Um, those of you who doubt the powers of astrology, uh, Cardano lived, uh, was born in the decade after Columbus discovered the Americas. And uh, eventually, I think in the 1520s, 1530s, uh, he made a, a prognostication about uh, the, what the, this would mean. And uh, this is his view on the discovery of America. It's sure to give rise to great and calamitous events. And uh, I think we all know that's true. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much.